And good morning, and it's great to see you guys. We just got back this last week from Brazil, and it, you know, just like any time you go to another country, it just is a reminder again uh, for all of the things that frustrate us, regardless of your political persuasion, we pretty much stay politically frustrated. Uh, so all, for all the, the things that are complex and complicated about our country and the cultural craziness we seem to be going through these days, I still believe with all my heart there's no comparison. We live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth, and we're proud to be Americans. Amen? If you're here, and uh, just, just because I think in the first two services we had this opportunity with the choir leading in a, a you know, musical for, for those to stand who have served our country in the armed forces. So in the balcony and down, uh, down uh, below, if, if you've served in any of the branches of our, our armed uh, services, would you just uh, stand to your feet so we can just praise God for your service? Would you do that? Yeah. And here's why I think that's important uh, for every generation in our church, for every service, no matter what the style. Listen, um, freedom's not free, right? And every one uh, of us enjoy liberty, but all that freedom we definitely enjoy and appreciate came at a price. And, uh, and we don't want to forget the past. We don't want to forget all that it's cost our country to be able to carry on the cause that is freedom and liberty uh, for our people. And so with that in mind, it really does apply in a very uh, real sense to our passage today. If you'll turn to Joshua, turn in, turn on your Bibles to Joshua. We're going to look at chapters 4 through 6 as far as the big picture of the story. Uh, we start a new series called Character Quest today. As you're turning to Joshua, I just want to say, uh, I know that you already had a, an announcement in your bulletin last Sunday. We kind of look with great anticipation to next Sunday. I want to encourage you not only to be here next week for third service, but man, get everyone that's been on vacation, give them a holler, and uh, make sure they're here because it's very significant. Next Sunday is a big day for our church. Uh, we're going to be actually given the opportunity to vote on two different positions. Uh, our personnel committees uh, made several announcements lately. One is about transition that Brother Ashley Moore is making to connections and recreation. Uh, and then also Kathy Robinson making a, 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 a transition into small groups uh, as our minister there. So we're going to be eventually hiring a new children's minister. All those things were big announcements that you should have received in an email on social media. But just to make you aware of that, but then on top of that, we're voting on two, two new staff positions next Sunday morning. And, uh, and one of those is the executive pastor of missions and creative arts. That individual will be leading worship in the third service. Now, they'll sing a song in the, in the first two, but won't be leading. Brother Randy, obviously, be leading in those two services. But uh, in the third, uh, he will be leading the worship. So that's, that's awesome. Brother Tillman will be helping out and be, be uh, definitely like normal in a part of that. But it's going to be a great opportunity for you to, uh, to see uh, him not only just on a bio sheet, but also leading a worship next Sunday morning. Then also we have uh, Director of Creative Services. Both of those positions will be voted on in the service. There will be a lot of explanation about that. In your bulletin as well, you have a schedule of the weekend. Because just like when I came, um, I know you can't disclose names for protection of families and everything like that and, and all. So in churches, we want to honor that. So uh, there's some level of uh, being discreet and just uh, you know confidentiality leading up to the weekend. But on Saturday the 9th, you're going to be able to come and just hang out, meet and greet. There's actually an answer question time, question and answer time before that in the afternoon. All of that's in your bulletin. So, man, please participate in that, uh, and that'll be helpful. Then on Sunday, there'll be even more opportunity for you to get to know them, but there'll be a, a, an opportunity for you to vote on all campuses and all services next Sunday. Exciting stuff taking place, and I promise you, you do not, you do not, you do not want to miss next week. And please bring the other 150, 200 people who've been on vacation every week for the last three weeks, all right? And I know we've kind of been like a revolving door because Amy and I, you know, we're out uh, last Sunday. There have been people out here and there. Let's just try our best to get everybody we know who's been, you know, going on trips and stuff say, man, if you're going to pick one in the next couple weeks to be here, July 10th is the week you need to be here. Let's do that. 
Uh, now that you're in uh, Joshua chapter 4, we're looking at character quest. The next few Sundays, really for the next uh, six to eight weeks, we're going to talk about uh, particular characters in the Bible. We're going to draw them out and look at stories that, uh, that tell a little bit about their characteristics that we can learn from, maybe even godly characteristics that we can uh, imitate, and at the same time, even look at the people who followed those people and characteristics that they possessed and how we can learn from those uh, characters in the Bible. Now, and, and the first one is Joshua. Uh, and we're on this journey of really trying to become the man, the woman that God's called us to be. Joshua is one of the coolest people in the Bible. I mean, it's just really neat to see the stories. He was such a courageous guy. When his back was against the wall, when everything was against him, he didn't chicken out. He didn't turn around and run from the, the difficulty. He faced it head on. And he actually had the audacity to believe that if God promised you something, you could believe it. Now, that's, that's a rare thing in our day, right? In our day and in, the, and in his day, a lot of people looked at the circumstances before they looked at the Savior, and they kind of weighed things out and said, well, we need to make a, a, a decision based totally on our ability. Well, Joshua refused to do that. There are three factors in particular we'll see in our text this morning that contributed to Israel's new beginning, because this was going to be a new beginning. Uh, a lot, obviously, had happened in the past. They had a lot of ups and downs. But here we see, first of all, we're going to talk about the first word you usually think about when you hear Joshua's name is courage. And so we're going to talk about the, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, as they followed Joshua, they did display a, a courageous faith. Now, it went through some transition, and they were la actually lacked faith to begin with, but eventually they did have great faith. But as they followed uh, Moses... God delivered them out of Egypt. Then eventually, Joshua led them across uh, Jericho. And uh, we see there's so many things that happen in the life of the children of Israel. But they, they had to always remember that, that courage requires that we remember. If we're going to be courageous in the future, we have to look back and see what God's done in our past. And every one of us can understand that because if you're a Christian... You know that you've walked through difficult times. You've had bad circumstances. And, and time and time again, even when your back's against the wall, God has delivered. God has never left you alone. It may be that you're in a position of discouragement today. And maybe you just need that encouraging word that God has not left you alone. You need to have courage. You need to have that courageous faith to stand even in the midst of circumstances that are difficult. But what did they remember? First, they, they remembered past victories. In chapter 4, they crossed the Jordan River. It says in, in uh, verse 8, basically God parted the Jordan River. Joshua commanded 12 men as they walked across to gather stones, right? He picked up these stones and, uh, and he created this, this, uh, this uh, monument, basically, to remember the victory, to remember all that God had done, to remember that they had been delivered from defeat. And so they had to remember these past victories. And, and so uh, Joshua led them through that in verse 8. But then we see in verse 21 um, that Joshua said, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Verse 22 says, Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry land. Man, this is so important because in our day, it is, if you were to go around and ask, honestly, people my age or, or below... Uh, stuff about simple U.S. history, most of them would not know anything. I mean, it's like, it's embarrassing. When you ever seen people interviewed, like, on college campuses, they're brilliant people, but they just don't know, like, simple historical facts about the founding of our nation, or sometimes even who our president is. It's crazy, you know? Uh, it's just the people just don't know simple things. Uh, that doesn't happen by accident. When people are ignorant, and that's not, that's not an intellectual insult, it really just means they don't know the information. When people don't know the information, the facts, the truth, it's usually because no one's told them the truth. And in this case, here's the deal. Joshua was saying, we're not going to let our kids forget. <laughs> I'm going to, we got to set a monument up. We need to put 12 stones, stack them up, so that when, when we're walking by them, it's a constant reminder of what God has done in our life. And, and in the same way, we, we need to remember our responsibility to train our kids, to teach our children, to teach our young adults. Man, that what God has done, not only in our individual lives, but in the life of our church, 
We've been on a journey for a long time, man. I mean, God has really done some amazing things. This is not the first time God is working. This is not the last time God is going to work. And we have to remember, this, is, this brings courage to us to remember that God has been faithful in years past. He has constantly, time and time again, delivered us as people. But then also as an individual. No matter what you're facing, man, God has not left you alone. God is going to be there. So be courageous, not in your own abilities or in your giftedness. Be courageous in his promise and trust him that he is enough. No matter what you face, no matter the circumstances, he's going to be there for you. Now, tomorrow is July 4th, and we're a people who remember our independence as a nation. We are thankful to God to be free, but we have to remember again, we have to look back and remember that that independence only comes because of our dependence on God as a people. I really do believe it's, it's remarkable truth about the founding of our country and even our identity through the years. We may have been people of different faiths, but we have been a people as Americans who have yielded to God. We have trusted in God. And, and that, that reality is changing over time, and it's a def, definitely a difficult thing to face because we have to understand the thing that has brought our independence and our consistent independence is our complete dependence on God. So we have to be surrendered, and that is kind of the point as, as we apply this individually and even to our church, we're going to see that reoccurring theme. So they remembered, first of all, past victories, but then also they remembered past mistakes. It'd be nice if everything was always just victories, right? If everything was just mountaintop, 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 but that's not the case because we're human. We mess up, man. We make mistakes. And the children of Israel were no different. In chapter 5, verse 6, we're reminded of this because you remember the story back in the day when uh, the spies were sent to, to uh, spy out the land and to see you know, what, what we should do as a nation. Ten spies came back and said, oh, it's, it's crazy. They were afraid. Their, their teeth were chattering. Their knees were knocking. They said, there's, I know what God says he's given us, but there's no way, guys. Have you seen how big these guys are? This is, they're huge. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way that we can beat them. But then there were two crazy spies named Joshua and Caleb, right? You remember the story? And Joshua and Caleb said, you know what? We believe, no matter what the, the circumstance, it doesn't really matter what the players on the field look like. God has already said the victory is in our hands. So Joshua and Caleb tried to encourage them. Let's do this. Let's go and do it. Let's, in obedience, let's just follow God, and he's going to give us the victory. But did they follow? No. Well, as a result, what happened? Israel fell back into rebellion, and that rebellion led them to consequences of despair. They wandered around in wilderness for 40 years. That sounds crazy. Why would, they, why would they have to wander for 40 years? Simply because they were disobedient. They were unwilling to follow God where he was calling them. And so in our, in our application for ourselves, man, if we want the promised land, if we want really to, to live in the promise of God, we've got to be obedient. Now, that really sounds really elementary. That's simple. But we forget that so much. Because even in the North American church, the reason that we're not functioning the way we should as churches in America is because we're not being obedient to God. We lose sight of our mission and vision. We actually lose sight of his purpose and plan for us. And we get on our own agenda. We do our own thing. And so, as a result, the nation has gone downhill because the church has ultimately gone downhill. So we've got to remember that our responsibility is to be faithful to the task that he's called us to, to do everything that he has called us to, not just what's popular. Ten spies said we shouldn't go. Two said we should. The two were right. The ten were wrong. But as a result, the entire generation that, that didn't want to go died in the wilderness. They didn't make it to the promised land, but Joshua and Caleb did. And so that brings us to where we are in chapter 6. And just remember this, courage requires that we surrender. Courage requires that, that we give ourselves over to God. We've talked a lot about preferences the last couple of months, probably. It just kind of comes out in, in, in uh, our philosophy of ministry and mission to understand that worship is not about us, it's about God. You know, ministry is not about us, it's about God. Missions is not about us, it's about God. So everything we're to do ought to be with, a, with an idea of surrendering our preferences and plans to God's. But see, that, that's not the norm. The majority of the children of Israel didn't want to do that. And so as a result, they lived in the, the wilderness for 40 years. 
But then we, we see this courage and surrender led Joshua and Caleb to a point of great victory again. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. And we'll see not only were they, dis, did they display a, a, courage, a courageous faith, but also they embraced a, a, a unified mission. Look at verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were secured. They were securely barred because of the Israelites. Jericho was afraid. So one went out, and no one went out, no one came in. The Lord God said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Notice the word all. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets and ram's horns uh, in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound the long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. There's some significant terminology in here. I hope you didn't miss it. It's important for us to remember that these people embraced a unified mission. And we likewise. we got to do the same thing. God has not called us to just go here and go there as a people of God. We're not called just to do whatever we want to. We're called to work together. We're called to be unified as a body. And that's what the people of Israel had to come to grips with. They knew that they, they couldn't be all over the place. But here's the deal. Unity is not uniformity. So unity doesn't mean that everybody has to look alike. That's why it's so beautiful. At First Baptist Simpsonville, we have a lot of diversity. We have a great deal of diversity. If you, even if you just look at our, our, uh, our services, 845, 10 o'clock, and 11, I mean, there's a lot of difference in our environments uh, on Sunday morning. But then on top of that, you look at West Campus, uh, who's going to be joining us at the end of August for five weeks. That's going to be an exciting time, too, before the launch in October. But then uh, we have Cappy Trails Cowboy Church, which is completely, again, a completely different group of people. We're very unique. Did you know that? We are, we're a unique group of people. We're not unified in the sense of uniformity. Everyone's not exactly the same. But we are unified in the sense that we're all going the same direction. And that's what's important. See, the children of Israel, I guarantee you, what I'm about to say is not, you can't read it. It's like an assumption that you can make based on just human nature, all right? But if you tell that many people that we're going to march around a wall for six days, not everybody's going to like the plan, all right? I promise you. I mean, I've been in Baptist churches for 20 years. Well, actually for 43, but, you know, lead as a pastor for 20 years. And here's what I'd say. If you got five Baptists, you got eight opinions. Amen? That's just true. That's just honest to God truth about, about Baptists, probably to Christians in general. But, uh, but I know if you, if, if you were one of those people that were marching around the wall, if I was in that group, there's no doubt we would have heard somebody just going... I cannot believe that Joshua is making us march around this wall. This is the craziest idea I've ever heard in my life. I've got to go to the restroom. Good night, you know. There would have been something because the, the, the reality is that many people, that many people could possibly, could possibly all agree this was the right thing to do. And I think in a church, especially a church that's going to grow, and, and we're already uh, a church that's, you know, at 2,000, if you count everybody on every campus, it's so important to understand there is no way, no way that we're always going to do everything the way that we think we should. From an opinion perspective, there's just no way. There's no way. Again, because we don't even agree with ourselves half of the time, right? And so we have to get to the point to where, every, and I think we are as a church, but even as a people, we have to understand, unity is not uniformity. We don't have to all have the same opinions or preferences. We don't all have to like the same color bathroom paint in the walls, right? You don't have to. I mean, that's, you know, sometimes somebody will come up and say, well, I just didn't like the way, I didn't like the route we took on that trip. Well, bless your heart. You know, it's okay. It's not a big deal. I mean, it doesn't even make you a bad person because you didn't like the route, right? It's okay. If you would have went a different way, if you were the leader... That's cool. Uh, we, you're just not the leader. And so it's somebody else that's leading and driving the van. So it's not a big deal. It really doesn't matter. So disagreements like that, differences of opinions, that's a healthy thing because it's diversity. You see, we need diversity. Diversity is the strength of the body of Christ. It's not a weakness. See, a weak church would try to make everybody agree on everything, period. That's a weak church because the only people they're going to reach is people like them. So our goal ought to be to become a very diverse church 
so that there's something in the sense of no matter who comes in this place, they feel like they belong, that they can identify with that person. There's somebody, there's somebody in that church that looks like them, maybe lives in, in a same, similar neighborhood, you know, acts like them. You know, from bikers to bankers, we can all worship together and love Jesus because it's him we worship, right? We're not worshiping some style. We're not worshiping some person or some preacher. We're worshiping Jesus Christ, and he's the one that brings us together. And so our preference has become secondary. Our worship of him becomes primary, and our happiness and our joy in our church, our body, it's not based on if we got our way or our opinion. It's totally based on we're obeying God together. We're unified, and, man, we're going to see some walls fall when we march around Jericho. So even if I'm tired, Even if I wouldn't have done it the way Joshua did it, the cool thing is I'm going to be living in the victory of God. And so that, man, that's got to get, that's got to be where we get, um, even individually, as people of God. Unity is not always unanimous in opinions, but unity should always be unanimous in action. We are going the same direction. Notice the language in this passage. In verse 3 and 5 in particular, Look, it says that word all. I pointed it out in verse 3. Then look at verse 5. The whole army. Look again in verse 5. Everyone straight in. You see, this, this terminology is all-inclusive language. It wasn't, you know, Joshua was commanded by God to include everyone, not to leave anybody out. I mean, everyone. And I, I even, again, this is, we speculate. There's no way we can know for sure. But I have to ask the question. If, if 10% of the people hadn't marched around the wall, would the walls have fallen? I, I, really, I really have to think no. Because God's command to Joshua is that all the people, that all of them obey. And so, man, this is, this is a pretty significant thing. So no matter what, we need to be together as the people of God. And again, this shows the, the decline of the church in North America. And, uh, and it, show, it really answers the reason. I, it's not even a difficult question to answer when someone says, why has the church lost its influence in our nation, in our culture? There are a lot of answers that are sub-answers to this. But, but you can boil them down to two things that are all really one. And, and that is that we're, we've been disobedient to God as the people of God. And so as a result, we're not living in His promise. We're ultimately living in the consequences of our rebellion. But then on top of that, we've not been unified. We've not even been unified in our rebellion. <laughs> if you think about it. I mean, the church of Jesus Christ in our nation is going a hundred different directions. Regardless. And we're just talking about the the Christian church, the evangelical church. When you say evangelical, you've got a hundred different factions to, to talk about. I mean, you know, and even within most churches, they can't agree on things enough to stay together and so end up splitting. This doesn't please God. And so here's the result. The result of that division among the church in North America has eventually led to the neutrality, to where the church is ineffective. It's not even influencing the culture anymore. And the main reason why is because we've lost our courageous faith. We're not courageous. And some people say, well, preacher, I just don't know if I want to be talked. You know, why would you talk about we're not courageous? It's just the truth. The reality is the church of Christ in our nation is, is reluctant to even stand for truth. We're reluctant to speak up on social issues that are very clearly defined in Scripture. Now, why would that be? It's because we become so concerned about and, and afraid of a cultural response to our positions that honestly, the church has become, we become hermit crabs. And we're kind of isolating ourselves inside some box. That is not a courageous faith, and it's not a unified faith, but here's the truth. The truth is, we are, for the most part, unified in our silence in this country. So Christians have become ineffective. Christians have pretty much become uh, an absolute insignificant part of our culture. Now, I will say part of the problem is we've tied ourselves to political parties in the past, which is a mistake for anyone. I don't think any faith, any religion, any Christian or non-Christian should tie themselves to a political party based on their faith. And here's the reason why. Political parties change. (laughs) Jesus doesn't. Amen? Amen. Uh, and so you may look at the political situation, and uh, I'm not. This is not political. This is just all right. This is just truth. You may look at the political situation. It may frustrate you. Welcome to my world, amen. I mean, it just may frustrate you. No matter who you are, you may look at it and say, well, "Who who do I identify with?" I mean, who 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 can lead? Here's what I want to say. You need to follow Jesus. 
first of all, all right? That we need to follow Jesus. And remember that our hope is not in a politician. Our hope is not in a political party. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. He is our hope. And so what has to happen is the church has to come back to Jesus. We have to come back to our first love, recognizing he's the answer. He's the one who can bring us hope. We're not courageous because of some guy. We're not courageous because of some party or some group of people. We are courageous in this nation And the only thing that's going to rally Christians back together is if we become courageous again in the truth of Jesus Christ, recognizing our hope is in Him. And even if we're only two of twelve who are willing to look at the landscape of our culture and see Jesus has offered promises to us that are still true today. Hey, even if you're only two of twelve, stand firm because you'll be the one that God allows to go into the promise, right? Ultimately, our problem is we fall back into the majority. It's easy to slip back into. Man, teenagers need to lean in. Listen, it's real easy. In your day, you think it's tough now. Get ready, buddy. It's going to be harder. When I'm a senior adult, wow, unless something changes and God brings revival to our nation, man, we're going to be so afraid to even say the word, the name Jesus in our culture. Unless something changes, be a Joshua and a Caleb. In a nation filled with spies that absolutely are afraid to face society. In the midst of an absolute culture bent away from, turned away from God. Man, we just need to be real. We need to love Jesus. And here's the other problem. We need to to love people. See, a lot of times people, people in the name of God hate people. And trash people. And hurt people. Look, Jesus, Jesus didn't hurt people. Jesus didn't even hurt sinners. You know who Jesus, Jesus preached hard to? Religious hypocrites. Jesus would... I've done got off my message now. See, y'all, see what y'all have done? Wow. But that's, Jesus get, got upset when religious hypocrites started condemning people in the name of self-righteousness. Jesus went and stood beside the woman in adult, caught in adultery, right? Went and stood by the woman at the well... He called Levi, who was a tax collector. Jesus didn't do things people expected him to do. Religious elitists caught Jesus' eye, and he called them vipers. But he loved sinners. See, the problem with the church is, I think we're drawn more to Pharisees than sinners. And and, and even when we're drawn to sinners, we don't really act like Jesus. Either either Christians are hateful to sinners, or they compromise and condone sin. But see, you don't have to do do either one of those ridiculous extremes. Be like Jesus. Jesus loved sinners. He cared about them. He didn't push them away from the cross. He cared about them. But you know what? He never said, oh, you just pat them on the back. You just keep living the way you're living, buddy. Jesus, over and over again, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. You see, the church has lost sight of being like Jesus. And so as a result, man, the culture has no, no desire to listen to our opinion. So we see Joshua really didn't have a choice in this matter. God gave him a plan. God gave him direction. And he knew that, that God required him to, to give these commands. Joshua didn't poll the people. He didn't take a, a survey. Uh, God usually just spoke very clearly. And Joshua led the people and they followed because they knew Joshua was a man of God. So he was confident in the command, and he communicated the plan. Our problem is never a lack of leadership from God. And I think that's a very important truth. Look, the fact of the matter is, God is going to always tell us what we need to do. Sometimes in our individual lives, we may be at a point to where we're saying, well, I just really don't know what to do at this point. You know, I, I, I once was hearing clearly from God, but right now I just don't know what he wants me to do. And I would, I would encourage you, John MacArthur said this years ago, powerful word of wisdom for me at the time. And that is, if you don't know what to do, if you're at a point and you just don't know what God's will is for you to, at that moment, just go back and do what he told you to do last. And I think that's some wise uh, words of wisdom. You just need to, you need to go back and do whatever he told you to do last, because God is not going to leave you where you are, hung up in the middle of, of, of not knowing what he wants you to do. God, God is going to tell you what to do. Our problem is, most of the time we hear what he says and we don't like it. And so instead of just being obedient, we say, ah, must have heard you wrong. That's what Moses said, right? <laughs> I think you got the wrong guy, God. You know, that's, uh, so sometimes, I mean, I, I wonder if we were the leaders that day at Jericho, would we have been like, you're talking about marching on a wall how many days? Seven days. 
Now, God, I, I really, I've got an old change scheduled Wednesday. I'm just not really sure. You know, our, we let everything in our life get in the way of God's plan. And so God can be very clear and deliberate with us about what we need to do. And we talk ourselves out of being obedient. And then what happens is the consequences of our even partial obedience becomes rebellion. Because that rebellion leads us to consequences of, of discouragement, despair, and defeat. And so partial obedience is completely uh, disobedient. And so we've got to remember, man, God pushes us toward this complete surrender. God calls us to surrendered lives. But the, I want you to look at the third factor. We've looked at they displayed a courageous faith. They embraced a unified mission. But then we also see they surrendered to a God-sized vision. This was a vision. This was a promise that God had given to Joshua and the people. He actually given it to Moses and the people. But, it's, but it, this principle applies in every area, guys. You can write this down and remember it to the day you die. Obedience leads to inheritance. Obedience leads to inheritance. Man, if you want to inherit the promises of God, obey Him. I mean, it's, you may say, preacher, that is so simple. Right, and we don't get it. We mess up. We fail. We know it's that simple, and we still disobey God. But see, that's the truth. Obedience leads to inheritance. There are people in here today that need to make a public profession of faith in Christ. You, you, may, you may know already that God is leading you to be saved, and you may want to be saved, but you've, you've made reason after reason, excuse after excuse, why you're not going to come and stand down in front of people. I just don't know if I need to be baptized. You know, God's not going to honestly, He's not going to honor you in the way He would until you're obedient to Him in baptism. And that may seem, man, that's just in my face, preacher. Man, I'm just wanting the best for you. And the, the reality is that oftentimes we miss God's best for us because we just aren't willing to obey Him in the simplest of things. And so just in the way of membership, I just don't know if I'm ready to be a member. We've only been visiting, visiting church for four years, you know. You know, I, here's the, the truth of the matter is it's a, a matter of commitment sometimes. It's really just a matter of commitment. Are we really committed to God and ready to plan our lives in a particular place? So I just want to encourage you in your individual life, obedience. Remember, obedience leads to inheritance. And it may be that in your life you, you know that God has led you a particular way, but you've not done that. And you're then saying, well, God, why would you leave me here? Why, why am I all alone? Why am I discouraged? Why is my job not going right? Whatever. And, and the truth of the matter is we, we can look back to a crossroads where we knew God was leading us here and we went there. Let me just encourage you, go back to the crossroads. And, and, and obey, because obedience leads to inheritance. Israel's destiny was victory. That's what God's plan was for them, as long as they were obedient. The armed men went first, verse 9, seven priests with seven horns, in verse 8. Ark of the Covenant followed, verse 9. Then look at verse 10. The Israelites marched around once, then camped for the night. And here's, I, I, this just kind of jumped out at me. It says in verse 10 that they were to walk six times around this, march six times around these walls, Without talking. Did you catch that in verse 10? They were to do this without talking. I don't know what's the greatest miracle. The walls falling down or everybody being quiet for six days. That's, that's crazy, right? I mean, I can't even... That's amazing. How did, how did that happen? This is such unity around the vision and mission. They knew that God was going to use them if they were obedient to Him. And so it's just, man, it was wonderful. Look at verse 16. Seventh time around the wall... Uh, the priest blew the trumpets. Joshua said, shout. Everybody shouted, and the walls fell. Look at verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged in. Notice, everyone charged in. Everyone charged in, straight in, and they took the city. So we see this beautiful picture of unified victory. Unified victory, but it's centered around unified obedience. It's obedience. And so we've got to see, in the, in, the, in the conclusion of the message, this is something I say often, you've heard it before probably, but man, the cause will be worth the cost. The cause is always worth the cost. When we're looking at the, the choices that we have to make, the difficulty, even what we have to give up, and I'm just going to be, man, I'm just real transparent, but listen, even what you have to give up to be a member of this church instead of, if, if you're younger and maybe you're thinking, man, my, I'm just really contemporary. I know there's other churches that do it this way, do it that way. What a senior adult has to give up in our church because, I, you know, they really dig traditional music or whatever. And to be a part of a church that's not all senior adults. And it's, I mean, because, so here's the deal. What, what makes it worth surrender? Why, what makes it worth the cost? Why would we, why would we come together? 
in unity. Why would we try to do what is absolutely humanly impossible? Because the cause is worth the cost. The cause that God has called us to is worth what it cost us to get there. So, man, I want to encourage you, be a part and not just attend a service. Get plugged in, get connected into the mission and the vision of this church. Become the man, the woman that God wants you to be because it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth your time and energy. It's going to be worth your resources. It's going to be worth it. The cause is worth the cost. And so regardless, I'm just going to encourage you over and over again to buy into this whole concept of courageous faith in the name of Jesus. And and to remember that the courage is going to come as we're obedient to God. We're going to remember what He's done, but we're going to also believe by faith that the best is yet to come. That the greatest days of our church are in the future, not our past. And so we're moving ahead with all that we can to do everything we can to be the people God's called us to be, to embrace His mission, to embrace His vision, to be uh, committed to the values that He's called us to. But at the same time, recognize it's not just about these four walls, man. It's about every day of our lives, that we're to take it to the world, that we're to be the light in the darkness, that we're to push back darkness in the upstate, that we're not to run and hide and be ten of the twelve, but we're to be the two. We're to be people willing. If no other church is willing, we're willing. If no other people is willing, we're willing. We're going to be obedient to God. We're going to follow Him into the promises that He has for us. Man, if you're here today and maybe you've never been uh, uh, saved, you, you'd say, you know, preacher, I, I believe in God, but I, I just, I'm not really a Christian. I've never publicly asked Christ to save me, forgive me of my sins. I've never been baptized. You are the most important person in this room. I would skip lunch and supper for three days, all right, to wait on you. Um, And so here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you've never made that decision, you need to make that decision today. Maybe you're in here and you say, Preacher, I've been here a while, ready to join the church, but I've really been holding back, a little reserved. Let me just encourage you. If you know this is where God's leading you to, to join, don't wait. Now, if you still don't know, don't come. But if you're sure, if God's told you and you know it's time, what are you waiting for, man? Let's, let's, go, ahead and, let's go ahead and start the journey. Uh, this is a great time to become a part of, of the fellowship. And, um, and so I want to encourage you to make those decisions. Uh, no matter what, you may just want to come down and pray and say, man, my, my circumstances are crazy. I just need courage. God, give me courage like Joshua had. Uh, no matter what, uh, let's, let's do business with God. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. God, I pray that you would speak during this time of commitment. We know your word obviously has been read. God, I I pray you would do something uncommon in our people and uh, just change us. God, make us more like you. Give us courage even to step out and make decisions we need to make this morning and not leave this place the way we came. We love you and we commit ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name, let's stand to our feet.